Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Moore and I'd like to welcome you to day two of the Handheld Learning Conference. Um, I know the big parties were last night and I've no doubt that the news from the House of Commons yesterday, which is, uh, and I wonder to the extent of the, oh, I met Graham last year and he told me about this conference and how influential it was becoming. I never doubted him, but I didn't quite um, imagine that it would reach, number, that it would reach the uh, Whitehall and we'd have on the, day of the, the first day of the conference we'd have the announcement of the scrapping of the SATS test. So um, congratulations Graham and everyone else who contributed to that. What I want to do today is, um, is to kick off, rather than just go straight into the program as it's set out in, this, uh, in, the, um, in your program, is to invite each of the participants who will be contributing this morning to come onto the stage. And I'd like to invite you to give us some questions, some feedback, some reflections, any ideas from the many conversations and presentations that took place yesterday. So I'd like to get started today with a bit of interaction with you. If you could offer some questions, some thoughts, and so on, that'd be great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite each of the panelists up here and then ask them to do a short introduction to themselves. And then I'll get the mic out there and I'll ask you to bring some questions forward uh, just for 10, 15 minutes just to kick the day off. So first of all, uh, I'm going to... Uh, introduce um, when I've got my program hand to hand. Uh, first up, I'd like to just Jeff Elwood. I don't think anyone has come further to, from has traveled further to be here than, than Jeff. So Jeff, you want to join us? Jeff's uh, uh, Margaret Allen, Richard Wormsley, Matt Locke. Gavin Dykes. And coming off the suspension at the very last minute, uh, Martin Owen, who's not Sean Keane. Thanks a lot. So do each of you want to just take the mic and just do a very quick talk with you, Jeff. The mic's underneath. Um, it should be under there, and it should be switched on. So do you want to just do a quick introduction to yourself? And, uh, G'day, good morning. How is everyone? Awake? <laughs> <Good week. laughs> uh, my name's Jeff, as you've heard. I'm from Hobart, Tasmania. Um, and I'm a bit of a travel tragic. Uh, I flew around the world 14 times last year. So I think 350,000 air miles or something like that. So, uh, and I've got to say, after the, uh, the second or the third trip, the glamour starts to wear off a bit. Um, but uh, it, I really love what I do. Uh, we're passionate about uh, technology and education, and uh, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Hi, I'm Margaret. Um, I work for Promethean. I'm, I'm a teacher by background, early years and key stage one, and I'm a sort of conscience, I think, for Promethean to make sure that we don't become engineering and technology-led, but actually remember that at the heart of what we're doing, it's about teaching and learning. And Graham invited me to contribute to this panel as the voice of the teacher, so I hope that um, those of you that are teachers out there, we can uh, have a bit of discussion going about the expectations on us and on you in delivering a technology-rich curriculum as well as being able to control 30-odd children at the same time. Hi, morning. Uh, I'm Richard Wormsley. I head up um, internet and entertainment services for T-Mobile. Um, I'm here today because I'm passionate about um, the possibilities of what the internet, particularly on your, on your mobile, can do. Uh, and I'm looking forward to a lively debate today about um, what kind of impact that can have on learning. Hi, I'm uh, Matt Locke. I'm the commissioning editor for education at Channel 4. Um, been in the role now about a year and a half since Janie Walker, the head of education, uh, shifted our budget from making TV programs for 14 to 19 year olds to focus on cross-platform projects. So I'm kind of three quarters of the way through the first year of a, a project where we've shifted the spend completely to uh, online cross-platform projects. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of that later on and the games. Before that, um, I was uh, running an innovation team at the BBC, so I've been involved in the uh, new media and innovation area for uh, quite a while now. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Gavin Dykes. I'm here with uh, JD Connect and uh, John Devonshire working with Ramjack. Uh, I'm an independent consultant working in education and I'd just like to tell you a, a little bit of background of why, why I'm passionate rather than just that I am passionate. Uh, at the age of 14 I moved from sc in school in Scotland to school in England and when I arrived in England I was uh, just told to follow the others around. Now I don't know how much you know about English history and Scottish history but when you won uh, we lost, and the other way around, if I can uh, judge you all to be, or many of you, to be English. So there, there was a big difficulty in the initial stages with the subject itself. 
and so follow, uh, just following through in education was really difficult. Another thing was that in my last exams in, in Scotland, and this is going back a long time ago, so forgive me for it, and I may embellish the marks a little bit, but in my last exams, I think I got 90% of mathematics in Scotland. In my first exam in England, I got 17%. Uh, it was interesting to see how I was treated in these two different situations. So I'm passionate about personalization, passionate about understanding learners, passionate about not uh, writing anybody off and recognizing the good in all. Hello, um, I'm Martin Owen, and uh, I believe that learning should be pleasurable, it should be inspiring, it should be hard, it should be substantive, and I think that technology can help us deliver on uh, those particular descriptors. Um, I am currently working on what I find a very, very inspiring project, in fact over 30 years of my life in this business um, is, is probably one of the most interesting. And we're collecting thousands of stories of people's careers uh, about how they are and where they are on video. Um, people from the carpenter to the captain of industry, from the Olympian athlete through to the struggling beginner. And um, we're trying as a project, and the project's called I Could, to deliver those stories in appropriate ways to young people, principally in the 14 to 19 age range, um, with as minimum of barrier between the learner and the resource as possible. Um, and so we're looking at all kinds of channels. We hope to have a YouTube channel coming up shortly. Um, but looking at mobile and looking at all kinds of ways in which we can get these inspiring stories uh, in their short form into the hands of children. Um, and that's part of my life, which pays the bills. Um, I am also um, developing uh, small, playful technologies, um, which range from uh, activities in early learning of tangible electronic devices through to um, trying to revive some of the spirit of, uh, if you're on the Future Lab stand, you see in the background um, children playing Savannah, which was uh, possibly one of my better ideas, um, where children were able to play and be mobile on the school field, but be able to be also part of a rich collaborative simulation uh, where they were learning real stuff like ethology and ecology together, but, but not necessarily sitting at a desk. They were truly mobile um, and, and moving around uh, in that process. So um, the two halves of my life are, one, I'm still playing with the toys, and two, I hope that there is a, a, a real tremendous potential for inspiring students. Fantastic. OK. Um, what I'd like to do now is to say that we're in a few minutes, we'll give, you'll have a chance to hear from, over the course of the next about few hours, you'll be able to have a chance to hear from each of the, the people on the panel at the moment uh, in a formal presentation. But, and you've got, there's lots of different ways in which you can interact with those presentations, and we'll explain more about that during the course of the morning. But for now, I'd like to get some any feedback from yesterday from anybody out there at the moment, any questions for the panel to comment on. We had a lot of content yesterday. I'd just be interested if anyone wants to pick up any threads from yesterday, any ideas, questions, whatever. And we've summoned right away. At the end of the afternoon yesterday, there was a lot of focus on assessment and, in particular, assessing GCSE. I wonder what the panel thought the place of peer and self-assessment would be in that, and what the place that is in handheld learning anyway, and whether they think that the results, as shown by the graph yesterday, which showed that the teachers were actually very accurate at assessing the children, whether if, the, if peer assessment was used, whether they think that would be as accurate. Margaret, I sense that might be one for you, if you forgive me, as the teacher on the panel. <laughs> I think it's always difficult as a teacher to not become defensive at this, at this stage, but um, peer assessment, if it's about children owning their space and owning what they want to do while they're in the classroom, then I think that's one thing. But if it's about somebody outside wanting to test 
whether or not the teacher's doing a good job and whether that is actually what's at the heart of the assessment that's going on. I think they're two different questions. And as I say, I feel gently vulnerable in sounding defensive for the teacher here. But I think that um, more and more we should be aware of what children, students, whatever age, are able to do and capable of doing and not be dictated by what others think they ought to be doing and what they should be achieving. And if we get those initial stages right, then I think the whole assessment thing will actually be much easier. I think at the moment we're driven very much by tables and by people seeing what others are doing rather than what children are achieving. Mar Martin, do you want to Possibly the most reliable and important piece of educational research that we've had over the past decade is the research by Paul Black and Dylan William um, on formative assessment and assessment for learning. It's quite clear that the best thing that a teacher or anybody can do for another learner is to let them know whether they're going right or wrong and how that they can start going right. Um, there is no substitute. You know, learning from mistakes has always been an important issue. And whether it's one of your peers that is picking up those mistakes for you or your teacher that's picking up your mistakes for you, the important thing is that your mistakes are being picked up. Um, that, 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 I think, at a micro level is just so important to remember. And that, that's the whole purpose of being communicative in your learning. Um, but on a general issue, um, who do you trust? Do you trust someone who has uh, a high score on a 100 question multiple choice quest test that has been validated and tested and proved to be reliable, or the opinion of their peers as to whether the person is appropriate? Now, it's very easy to assume that the reliability of the test is what you're going to choose on. But supposing you've done a test on brain surgery, or it's your peers and fellow brain surgeons that have an opinion of you, I'd actually rather trust the evaluation of my peers at that point rather than someone who's actually passed uh, a test. Good. Gavin, one final comment on that? Just a, just a quick comment. I, th I think we, we tend to, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, to undervalue the, uh, the judgment and the contribution that can be made by other learners in, in the whole process. And in fact, there's, as control has moved away from uh, people thinking to uh, following a process, I think that's been reinforced. I think there's been some great work by, for example, Dan Buckley in the personalization by pieces, looking at skills and children coming through and assessing other children's skills uh, and showing that they can be as strict, as, uh, as accurate and as good in, in assessing as uh, any of the uh, professional assessors, as it were. In uh, Ultralab with Stephen Heppel and the work that was done for uh, su mutual support by teachers and mutual assessment, I think that came through as well. And I'm also working with Stephen Heppel on the professional doctorate program internationally which also is trying to work on that people taking responsibility and I think if one of my reflections from yesterday I was really saddened to hear a lot of talk about what I would broadly call blame culture because I think what we need to do much more is to be taking responsibility uh, and each of us can take responsibility at different levels in different ways but we can also where we have the power give responsibility to up to to others thank you Gavin next question please right I just want to go just let us know who you are, please, as well. You've got... Um, what I was going to say was that... Um, sorry, who are you again, sorry? I'm Del House, yep. uh, here from the Ministry of Defence. OK. Uh, I, I've been involved in sort of e-learning over the last couple of years, and it seems to me that there is a very high predominance on commerciality, although everybody says it's handheld learning. If we look at the panel, for instance, most of them are commercially based, even the teacher. <coughs> so um, I'm a bit concerned that over the period of this last couple of days, we've seen a very high predominance of the commercial aspects of e-learning rather than perhaps the social aspects or the, wow. the impact on the sociality that we might be enforcing on young children that aren't able to make choices. I mean young, I'm talking, you know, uh, early, not sort of 15 or anything like that. Brilliant deal. Who wants to come back? Who wants to respond to that? Yep. Yeah, Margaret. Okay. I take your point and I think it's really important that that's acknowledged that we're not sitting up here peddling kit and trying to get people to buy things for the sake of it. But I'd also like to gently challenge what you say in that I am a teacher, I did qualify, I trained to be a teacher, I've been a practitioner. 
And I think it's important that people like myself are employed by the commercial arm to ensure that there are opportunities for the commercial arm to ensure that what's being offered in the classroom is relevant, suitable, and actually makes a difference. And yes, we could say that we're just up here to try and sell you some more kit, but I actually take that to be gently insulting, although I do take your point. Sure. Yeah, I think the other point about that is um, uh, the presupposition that uh, we force technology onto uh, uh, students and uh, this is what we make, therefore go use it. Um, uh, certainly in our experience, uh, all of what we've developed over <coughs> the last 15 years has been led directly by the interaction with schools. So uh, it's been teachers, students and parents who've been driving the development of our product. So it's not like, here it is, go use it. So I think you know, that's an important aspect as well to look at. Gavin, go on. Sorry, I, uh, just briefly, I, I spent 50, 18 years, in fact, in further education uh, and, further, and higher education. And in that period, the, some of the, or a significant part of my work was working at the interface between industry and education. Uh, for example, some of, the work, some of the work I enjoyed the most was working with the uh, FA Premier League uh, and supporting young footballers uh, and working on the technology side, how, to, how we might support them. What I always found in that situation was it was wise to think about the two, two overlapping circles, a Venn diagram, if you like, and thinking about where our agendas overlapped. And so long as we were working in that space, I was comfortable sitting in education. As soon as the, we stepped outside so that we were working to the, uh, to the agenda of the commercial people, whoever they may be, then I'd be uncomfortable. And if we were drawing the commercial people in too closely to what was the basic core of education, perhaps that was difficult too. So I think it's about we shouldn't shun, shy away from working with uh, commercial and private sector organizations. They have a lot to give, and there's a lot of motivation uh, and a lot of... Uh, proper interest and support for education with which we should work. But by the same token, think about it clearly so that you're overlapping, you're working in that area that really supports your agenda too. Do I come back to it on that, Dale? Is it on? Yep. Yes. I'm very sorry if I did insult anybody out there, and I didn't really mean to, but <laughs> I, I do actually think that rather than sort of run hen headlong into this, which I find personally very exciting, we need checks and balances, and I'm not sure I've seen too many this week, that's all. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'd just like to raise perhaps the odd controversial issue, um, even if it does raise a few prickles. Um, I think it's, it's right that we should do that. I think you're right. I think what this conference needs is a bit of dissent. So thanks for that, Dale. That's great. And who's next? Anyone else got a pressing question? Okay. Ah, uh, Tom. Right. <laughs> dissent, that's what we want. Hi, uh, Tom Dolan from Simex. Um, it was interesting yesterday seeing the way that um, PSPs and DSs are being used in the way that schools television used to be used. So sort of 10 minutes of inspiration at the beginning of the lesson to get people going. Um, I was wondering, if we stay within the kind of the commercial area, um, do we think that the traditional education providers are going to be getting, the publishers are going to be getting better at being entertaining, or are the games publishers going to be get, getting better at being educational? Matt, that's one for you. Um, uh, to be honest, I think it's harder for the former than the latter, personally. Um, I mean, you're competing for attention now, uh, particularly with older teen audiences, uh, with, with such a huge amount of hugely expensive produced content that um, a lot of the stuff that tries to take um, forms like social media or gaming into the classroom, you know, just simply can't compete. Um, so I think there is a really big challenge in producing uh, material specifically for the classroom that tries to compete with the level of finesse that, say, uh, uh, you know, a Nintendo or an EA game would um, uh, outside of the classroom. And I think one of the challenges for teachers, and I, I know Graham spoke yesterday um, uh, about his use of, of, of uh, commercial games in the school, um, the challenge really is, is, is to produce things that, that actually teens want to use and want to play outside of the classroom. Um, and that's something that we're trying to do at Channel 4, and I'll talk about that later on. And it is a real challenge. You know, I'll talk a lot later on about the challenge of getting attention. I mean, the reality is, um, if you're making work for the web, if you're making work for these uh, new forms of distribution, um, it is easier than ever to pr produce something, but it's never been so expensive uh, to be ignored. Um, and the kind of dirty secret of the web is that, you know, these 
platforms for distribution, you know, whether it's YouTube, whether it's uh, creating casual games on places like Miniclip and stuff like that. They're incredibly powerful if you're producing content that is in the top kind of 5% um, in terms of quality, in terms of impact, in terms of entertainment. Um, but for that huge long tail, it's a very, very expensive way of producing content that, that teams just don't like and ignore. Um, and I think you know that, that we need to have a discussion about how you can compete or, or how uh, uh, you can co-opt some of the more commercially produced material as well. Just pick one more question, please, be, before we move into the uh, panel session. Right, right down there. Yep, right behind you. Yep. Oh, Matthew, it's on. Hi, Matthew, Fre Matthew Freeman from Continue. Um, it was very interesting yesterday hearing about the new technology and the way that's going to be used in education. Um, I'll, I think one of the feelings for myself was we almost seem to be at the dawn of a new era where there's so much technology that we're almost like kids in a sweet shop and there's a need to overuse it all the time. And I want, we didn't hear much about regulation and I wonder what our aims are. Do we want children to be virtually interacting with one another all the time, surfing around in the second life, or do we want them playing football having music, doing singing, all these wonderful things as well, and what the panel feel about regulation and ensuring that the use is in some ways monitored and in some ways used to productive ends. Okay. Um, I've got the mic, so I'll start this <laughs> one. Um, quite frankly, I wouldn't want any kid uh, surfing around his second life uh, for a couple of reasons, um, <laughs> which I won't go into too much here. Um, I, I chaired a, a session last week um, at the Adam Street Club that uh, online uh, communications did uh, around some of these issues. And about three quarters of the way through the session, um, I realized that actually we'd started the conversation from the traditional one when people talk about technology and, 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 and social networks and, and education. The feeling that you know, there is a very, very hard barrier um, and the discussion is do we take that barrier down or do we leave it up? And actually from hearing the people talk, and that's something which you know, uh, I've seen uh, from reports on the web, but a lot of people talking about uh, in the last day or so, um, I don't think there's going to be that big bang moment. I don't think there's going to be this huge kind of moment when suddenly everyone's allowed to use social technologies. Um, I think what we're seeing instead is lots of teachers making very, very specific tactical decisions about what they use in their classrooms. And in a way, I think what we need to do is, is, is not necessarily have very draconian regulation, but to empower teachers and educate them so that they can make you know, very informed decisions about the risks um, that their students might face using some of these technologies, and they can do the best to educate their kids in turn and, 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 and uh, use those technologies in a responsible way. So I kind of think that we tend to make this a very binary opposition. It's like, you know, do you uh, use social technologies or don't you? In actual fact, loads of teachers are, and they're all using different ones, and some of them are using them a lot, some of, them, some of them aren't. And I think what we're seeing is a kind of gradual, you know, um, a gradual kind of seeping into the classroom of these technologies rather than a big, uh, a really big bang moment. Um, the internet, the classic phrase about the internet is it sees regulation as a, uh, as a bug and, and, and roots around it. And I think we're kind of seeing that in education as well. The other point I was going to make was uh, what we've found uh, to a large extent is that it, it is uh, self-regulating. Uh, there's definitely an amount of uh, acceptable use uh, that needs to be thought through. What we've found is, um, I'll give you an example, uh, students are quite comfortable with teachers chatting with them on, uh, on an instant messenger um, uh, in our experience, but one of the things they're not very comfortable with, and it's overstepping a boundary in terms of their personal sphere, is uh, calling their mobile phone. You know, so I guess the, uh, uh, the question there is, um, what is appropriate, what isn't appropriate? You know, there's uh, different rules and regulations, horses for courses, but I think to a large extent it becomes self-regulating. Uh, the only thing I'd like to add to that is I, I do worry for those teachers who are still trying to play catch-up. Um, that doesn't mean that they're poor teachers. It means that they haven't yet embraced technology. And I think just because they aren't embracing technology doesn't mean that they're teaching poorly or not giving children the right to, to use technology. So I think it's incumbent upon us to give them scaffolds and to give them platforms which they can build towards. And hopefully we try and do that in embracing technology and offering to teachers the opportunity to use technology. So let's not judge them too harshly if they don't, but find ways in which we can help them to utilize it more effectively. I think what's important is, uh, I think there definitely is a role for regulation and in a, in a rare example of collaboration in my industry, uh, we introduced uh, a parental content lock from the start for internet usage for, for mobile phones because we were very conscious about um, 
some of the risks and also some of the, the concerns that obviously parents and teachers have. So there definitely is a role for, for regulation. I think equally though, uh, just to reinforce a point that's already been made, there is a danger that we see, te see uh, technology as new stuff and anything that we're comfortable with that perhaps we all grew up with as something that is safe. Uh, and I think actually history shows that um, we should be optimists. Technology, perhaps I would say this, but technology does generally bring overwhelmingly positive things into our lives and brings new opportunities. And if you're uh, below the age of 25, I don't think you really see a divide between, it's something that, that we'll come on to talk about, but I don't think you really see a divide between the offline and the online and different forms of communication. They're just different ways to connect to people. Um, there are some different risks and that's why there is a role for regulation, but I think we should be as I say, optimistic about the potential of those new forms of communication and understand that it will take time for us all to adapt to how we're going to use that and, and, and to the point just made where those boundaries are. Okay, okay just one more comment and then we'll just close the session now. So. Um, I closed the first handheld learning conference in 2005 with a talk called Hands-Free Learning. Um, fundamentally, the computer as we know it is going to vanish. It will be. You know, technology is moving on, and, and we are currently in a particular phase. It's going to change, so just don't get too upset about the technologies we have at the moment, because they certainly ain't the technologies we had ten years ago. Good. Okay. Do I say something else quickly? I was just going to say. I, it just occurred to me very quickly that um, actually, if we talked about regulation three weeks ago. Uh, I'd have thought it uh, was a, a different thing to what it, the way I think of it today, and it seems to be rather better than it was before. Um, the, I think one of the things that's important in this is uh, recognizing that as the world changes, uh, young people are often the drivers of that change, or, or certainly uh, caught up in it. And uh, if we want to connect with learners of any age, frankly, we need to work in their world wherever that world happens to be. So we use the communication tools which are appropriate to them. I think also that for those people who are not engaging with these tools, I reflect on the nature of my work today and uh, the way I have contact with people, multiple lines of contact, multiple bits of work going on at a time, and wonder to what extent are we preparing people for the wor uh, that world. Uh, and don't mistake me, I'm not saying education is about preparing people for work alone, because that world is not just about work, it is about my entertainment, it's about my social life, it's about everything. So I think we uh, are falling down somewhere if we don't engage with this and we don't support uh, learners of every age to engage with that world. Brilliant. Okay, well I'm just going to bring this session to, to an end. I want to just thank Martin and Gavin, Matt, Richard and Margaret for their contributions. If you want to make your way off the stage now, I'll bring on, and um, you're going to hear a lot more from each of them during the course. <laughs> well,